If you love me, he says, keep my commands. Some of you will be familiar with the idea of love languages. That all, all of us have uh, a, a variety of love languages that we, that we uh, offer and we receive love in different ways. See if you can remember them. There's five of them. Those of you who done the marriage course, do you know your love languages? Uh, uh, call them out if you know what they are. Come on, love languages? Gifts, right. You, some people like to receive love through gifts. Anybody else? Acts of service, words of affirmation, physical touch, John Beagley. <laughs> One more, huh? At quality time, well done. And I'm sure there's many more, but those are the five that people give and receive love in. Uh, so okay, I've asked my wife whether I can share what hers is. Hers is acts of service, which as someone who is not acts of service, I find really hard. When I realized that that was the card that i drawn, I was like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. I can't believe that's your love language. I can't believe I have to serve you in those ways. So like, it doesn't really work to buy a bunch of flowers on my way home or whatever. No, I've got to do the washing up or got to do something like really practical and serve and I, I really struggle with it. Uh, and, um, and love languages is a way in which we express and receive love for one another. Jesus' love language is a sixth one, on the other hand. Jesus' love language is obedience. If, if you love me, he says, keep my commands. Keep my commands. In the passage that Rosa read for us, when we ask ourselves the question, well, so what are these commands? He's actually asked the question himself. He's had a bunch of times over in the passage prior to what Rosa read. uh, He's uh, he's tested on a bunch of things about whether there's going to be marriage and after the uh, resurrection and so on and so forth. There's all these different questions that he's asked. Uh, and, And then somebody says, well, which of the commandments is the greatest? And he says... Of all the commandments, someone says, which is the most important? Now, there's 613 commandments that Jesus could have chosen. And of course, famously, he responds, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and all your strength. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, of all the commands, of all the 613 that you can pick from, this is the one that I want you to focus on. Firstly, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. I want us to be a community that is in line with what Jesus says. He says, if you love me, obey my commands. And by the way, the greatest command that there is, is to love the Lord your God. And by inference me, because he says later on in the Gospels, he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. All your heart, the center of our physical being. Everything that we are, not just our physical being, but in in Jewish understanding, it would have been also our spiritual being. Everything around who we are as a person wrapped up in our heart. Jesus says in in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, but where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. It's the place where we put our priorities, the things that we value in life is what it means to respond with our heart. He says, love the Lord your God with your heart and then with your soul. The soul was understood to be uh, the seat of our feelings and our desires and uh, and our um, affections. That our soul was that sense of uh, the desires of of who we are. He then says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The mind is the place of understanding the world, perceiving the world, also linked to desire. In fact, all three of these words, heart, soul, and mind, speak to desire. Because fundamentally what Jesus knows, what God knows in writing these commands in Deuteronomy, is that actually for us to worship is to align our desires with the God that we worship. 
Because fundamentally, when our desires change, that is what points us to that which we worship. If we didn't desire something, we wouldn't invest in it. We wouldn't spend money on it. We wouldn't spend time on it. We wouldn't give our emotional energy to it. That which we desire, whether through our heart and our soul and our mind, points us to who we then worship. And so no wonder Paul says in Romans 12 verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. When Paul talks about renewal of our mind, he he thinks of it like uh, a renovation or a restoration. Imagine you've got a room in your house that's been a bit, that looks a bit tired. You, you say to your friends, your housemates, your family, you say, do you know what? I feel like we should do up the living room or we should do up the bedroom or the bathroom. What you're saying is this needs a complete refresh. I want to think about this differently. I want to look at this room in a different way. And what Paul is saying here is be transformed by the refresh, the renewal, the revamp of your mind. Give it an update. Give it a refresh but be transformed in doing so. Your outlook will change. And at the moment in our world, there is a, there is a lot fighting for, the, for our attention and our mind about what we believe and about the things we believe about one another and who we are. Be transformed, Paul says, by renewal of your mind. And why is that important, he says? Because then you'll be able to attest and approve what God's will is for us. So when, it, when, we, when, God, when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul and your mind, it is giving everything over to God in worship, in love. And finally says, and then love the Lord your God with all your strength. It's not just strength as in force or might, but it's also your ability. Everything about you, you give over to loving God in the best way that you can. Give over in love, in strength, in, in might, with everything that we have. So you might ask the question, well then how do I get strong enough to worship in this way? Well, Paul gives us uh, a, a bit of a, a, a nod in the right direction in, ver- in, in Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 1 verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. What is it that gives us strength? Well, according to Paul, it's hope. It's hope that gives us strength. It's hope that gets us out of bed in the mornings to enable us to carry on. It's hope that believes in a different kind of future. It's hope that drives us to keep on going when we have not got anything left in the tank. It's hope that drives us forward. It's hope that we find in Jesus Christ. It's hope that there's a future that is different from the one that we imagine. It is hope all the time that gives us that strength to carry on. No amount of willpower is going to do it, but hope a hope centred on the person of Jesus Christ is the, it leads us to, to, to the same power that is the same as the mighty strength that rose Christ from the dead. That's the kind of power that hope has. So when you are just about to give up in your love of Jesus because life has been too hard or you're at your wit's end, fix your eyes on the hope that is in Jesus. And no wonder The writer of Deuteronomy, and no wonder Jesus in his echoing of that, reminds us that we need strength to love God. That we do it with all of our strength because it is not easy. Because keeping going is what sometimes it can only sometimes be about. I want us to be a church that is known for our love of Jesus. It is about him to love him with our heart, soul, mind and strength. The last time we had a Sunday where we looked at the vision of the church, I talked about us being the kind of church that is race ready. We looked at what it means for us to run the race, to put the things in place that enables us to run that race well. But we primarily need to be starting at the right starting line. 
to be beginning the race at the same point, all together on the same page, to set off, if you like, with the same map in our hands. And we're still working on those foundations. We're still working on being race ready. But the one that matters most is our pursuit of Jesus. And it's hard. It's hard to pursue Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. How much am I willing to put on the altar the life that I am building for myself? And you know, the older I get, the more hard it gets. Maybe because I lose a bit of courage along the way, but I think fundamentally is there that there is more on the line to risk. Do I trust Jesus with my future? Do I trust Jesus with my kids' future? Do I trust Jesus with the finances? Do I trust Jesus that I might get things wrong in following him? We build a life for ourselves. But unless Jesus is at the centre of it, it will never satisfy. Jesus picks this up in the passage. Because, in fact, no, not Jesus, but the person, the teacher that's listening to him. He says in the passage at the very beginning, he says, it is right, he says, in saying that God is one and that there is no other but him. And then he goes on and says, it's more important than all burnt offerings. All burnt offerings and sacrifices. In other words, he says, this thing that we are called to do, to love the Lord your God with all our heart, soul and mind, is worth more than all the other sacrifices that you have laid out in your life. The sacrifice of friendship, the sacrifice of raising kids, the sacrifice of what you give yourself to at work. All of those things are important. But the most important, he says, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart soul and mind. Following Jesus will and does cost us. It will cost you. It will cost you your reputation. Because there are some things that Jesus says that frankly in today's day and age don't go down very well. It will cost you some of the dreams that you've spent decades building up to. It will cost you your finances. It will cost you your yearning for comfort. And I wonder, actually, to be a follower of Jesus, I wonder whether if it's not uncomfortable, whether we are actually following him as much as he's calling us to. We sing that song, don't we? You're never going to let me down. We just sung it. You're never going to let me down. You're never going to let me down. And the question I have for myself is, do I believe that? Do I really believe that he's not going to let me down, no matter what? Because if I really believed it, would my life fundamentally look different? That he holds me and those that I love and those close to me in my life in his hands. We follow the God who took the step onto earth and it cost him everything. It's the only faith, the only belief system where the God that we worship died at the hands of his worshippers, at the hands of his created order. It will cost us. It cost the first disciples everything too. Some of you will sense that the Lord is calling you to serve this community for much longer than you plan to. to raise kids in London when you never imagined that you would raise kids in London. To have a smaller space than you imagined that you would ever have. To see friends move on in highly transient London and yet you are left behind serving God in this community. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, this is part of the call. To love Jesus, you see, is not about a comfort mascot that we have in our pocket to reassure us of the decisions that we've already made. To affirm those things that we already believe about the world to be true. And he pops up every so often, sits on our shoulder and says, well done, I agree with all your decisions. To love Jesus is to say, no, you come first. Whatever you ask me to do. 
Jesus is the person around whom everything pivots. And I wonder whether the test in our life when we ask those questions is to say, if Jesus asked me to do the opposite of what I'm currently doing right now, would I still be willing to do it? I wonder if we, we asked ourselves the question, is Jesus the first person I speak to when I'm making any major decision in my life? Because ultimately, when all else is stripped away, there is only Jesus left. He will never let you down. He will never forsake you or let you go. When all is stripped away, and some of us find this out the easy way, and some of us find this out eventually the hard way, there is only Jesus left. All the other stuff is great, but eventually it fades away. Pope Benedict, who died recently at the World Youth Day in Cologne in 2005, said this to a bunch of, well, hundreds of thousands of young people. He said, dear young people, the happiness you are seeking, the happiness you have a right to enjoy has a name and a face. It is Jesus of Nazareth. Only he gives the fullness of life to humanity. And with Mary, Pope Benedict said, say your own yes to God, for he wishes to give himself to you. Everything else will fail eventually. If you put your identity and hopes in anything or anyone else, they will eventually fail fail you in one way or another. I've been ordained almost 18 years. And in fact, I've been in some form of church leadership for the last 25 years. No, no, that can't be possible. You don't possibly look old enough. That's right. Thank you so much. I appreciate your... Um, yeah, your affirmation, words of affirmation, by the way. Um, and I, in those 25 years, I haven't, haven't really stopped. Uh, it's been funny to always be in some form of uh, church leadership in, in some way since the age of 18. But I think I've come to realise recently, particularly in the last couple of years, that, that to be the kind of church leader that you need me to be is that I need to learn what it is again to pursue Jesus outside of that role, to have a bit of a break from the role. And so uh, I'm not going to take a holiday, but I am going to take a sabbatical uh, uh, beginning in February for a few months. Sab sabbatical is taken from the word Sabbath. It's a, it's a word that is not about holiday or day off. It's about a time given over to the pursuit of Jesus. To learn what it is again to be a child of God to stop work, to enjoy rest, to practice delight and contemplate Jesus. In the Church of England, it's encouraged that you take one every seven to ten years. I haven't ever taken one, just kept going. I uh, first said to uh, the church council in autumn 2019 that I was going to take a sabbatical in summer 2020. Some of you were on the church council at the time. Then something else got in the way, the global pandemic and other things. Um, and so really it's been trying to get to that point where as a church we can be moving forward and for me to be able to take a step back. So uh, I'll be taking a, a break to pursue Jesus um, from the beginning of Feb. It isn't a holiday, there will be some time of rest, but it will be a significant time of seeking the Lord. And it isn't as well a slow way for me to leave out the back door without anyone noticing. I will be back uh, to, to coin a phrase. Um, less terminators involved in that return. Um, and uh, I'll be back at the end of uh, my sabbatical because I want to take the time to model, to model as a church leader what it means to pursue Jesus. And I, I would love for you as the church here, to join me in that season. 
to join me in pursuing Jesus, to take that time. Uh, Because we want to be the kind of church where we see Jesus honoured and glorified, pursuing him. Before we get to the point where others are being invited in and welcomed in. This is what the church's primary calling is, to be a church that pursues after Jesus. We love the Lord our God first, and then the second commandment Jesus reminds us is then we love our neighbour as we love ourselves. And I believe that order is really important because I believe that when we pursue the love of our God with all our heart, soul and mind, I believe we begin to see our neighbours, those near us, as he would see them. But I think if we start with loving our neighbours first, maybe, and I could be wrong, but maybe we begin to see God as our neighbours see them, see him which may or may not be the God that we see represented before us in Scripture. So how would you join me in this season as we pursue God together in different ways? Well, not really any different from any other relationship. Four things. Firstly, learn to love his presence. Learn to love his presence and listen to his voice. Spend time with him. Get to know him. Begin to recognise his voice. How do we recognise his voice? Well, we have his word, his words of life written on pages that we will recognise his voice from. Secondly, church, we need to learn to love the people that he loves. Starting with his family. To spend time with his family. To spend time with one another as the church. Particularly, may I say, the ones that are not like you. And I'm going to say this just to those of us who um, are at the life stage where we have kids. It's very easy in the busyness of family life, and I say this as, as a dad of four, to sometimes forget that there are people who are not in that stage of life. My encouragement to you is to bring people into your family, into your homes, offer hospitality and love to those that are not like you, to model that kind of hospitality that is not simply about those that are most near to you. And you might think, gosh, they wouldn't want to come into my home. My kids throw food at the walls. Uh, They will have a tantrum. They're going to see me getting cross at my kids. I don't know. They, and I've, I've had these conversations with people who are not in that life stage. They said, I want to be part of that. So can I encourage us to bridge, build bridges outside of those of our normal circles, to break loose of those things and bring people into those spaces from different backgrounds, different life stages, so that we can be the church and spend time with each other. So learn to love uh, his presence and his voice. Learn to love the people he loves. Thirdly, learn to serve each other. We're all often at the end of ourselves, busy, busy people but we all might have that just that extra bit that we can give to serve somebody else around us. And finally, and I'll end with this, learn to depend on him. If you want to pursue the love, the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, learn to love his presence and his voice. Learn to love the people he loves. Learn to serve and learn to depend on him. Going back to that verse in John chapter 14. If you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you an advocate to help you and be with you forever. This is the kind of church I would love us to be. The kind of church that we build together, that Jesus promised he would build and our job is to pursue him as he builds it. And his promise in turn was the gates of Hades will not overcome. Let's stand and worship together.